Well, good morning, and a very warm welcome. Oh, I've just lost it. Is that us back? Good to see you all. A uh, very warm welcome to worship this morning, and a particular welcome to visitors. And we have quite a few visitors with us here today. It's great to see you from as far afield as Canada and uh, in other parts of the country to Lawrence Kirk. Yes. Uh, I should get you to put your, ha put your hands up if you're a visitor. Aberdeen, Lawrence Kirk, America, Canada. So that's lovely to see, and Dundee. <laughs> Good to see you all. <clears throat> and uh, a particular welcome to those of you who join us um, online. Great to have you with us too. At the close of the service, please do wait for tea coffee um, if you're able they'll be they'll be served downstairs in the undercroft everyone's welcome and we have a birthday cake to share uh, so you must get there kind of fast if you want a bit um, because last Thursday Ruth sheared celebrated her 90th birthday <coughs> Uh, so congratulations, Ruth, and uh, we're delighted to have Jessica and Richard, your, your um, niece from Canada with us, uh, and uh, her husband today. Among uh, the other intimations, let me highlight first the bell service next Sunday, which will <clears throat> include a, a celebration as announced in the written notices of our magnificent bells and our magnificent bell ringers. <clears throat> we'll be reflecting on faith and the creative arts. Um, and also volunteers are sought to assist at our fringe events. During August, our building here will host over 70 performances during the festival fringe. If you can spare some time selling tickets and programs or ushering, Mary Margaret Scott will be delighted to hear from you. Uh, there are help forms available in the inner vestibule. Our call to worship is in the words of the familiar, much-loved 133rd Psalm. And the response is in bold. How very good and pleasant it is. It is like the precious oil on the head. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. We worship God together, singing our first hymn, number 715. Behold the mountain of the Lord.
unite in bringing to God our prayers. Let us all pray. Almighty and eternal God, full of grace and goodness, of holy love and endless kindness, we gladly bow our hearts in humble, adoring worship. We contemplate with wonder all that you have made, the works of your hands, from the mind-numbing immensity of the universe with its myriad planets and galaxies, to the singularity of a little summer flower. We are in awe of your wisdom, power, and creativity. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Today we marvel in you at your infinite love for us, revealed supremely in the gift of your Son, our blessed Saviour, Jesus Christ. You have made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned us with glory and honour you have given us dominion over the work of your hands with responsibility to care lovingly for your good earth and its creatures. We owe our very lives to you in whom we live and move and have our being. Gracious God, we come this morning to seek your mercy and forgiveness. In our sin and folly, we have forgotten you, imagining that we can order our own lives and control our own destiny. In pride, we have aspired to be God with no need of our Creator, turning our backs on you and posing as deity. We have ended up in a complete mess and have exploited and polluted your good world. Have mercy on us. Teach us the way of wisdom, learning the fragility of our existence, the uncertainty of tomorrow, the transience of our lives. We thank you that you have not abandoned us, but are calling us to yourself in humility, in repentance, in faith, in love to discover again our true place in this amazing order, this theatre of your glory, as those who have been made above all else for you, and in that relationship of love, finding how to relate to our fellow human beings and to our world. Your mercies, Lord, are so great. Forgive our cold ingratitude and foolish pride. Give us grace to face the painful truth about ourselves and set before our eyes the cross of our Saviour Jesus, who is our hope and our life, who beyond all deserving has loved us and while we were yet sinners died for us. Come to us today in the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. Make us a people of faith, love and compassion. May we and all find in Christ the peace that you long to give us, peace with God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Strengthen us to meet the challenges of our daily lives with faith and patience. Draw near us now and give us joy in our worship. May we and all people turn our face to you, our Creator and our Saviour, and with gladness acknowledge, O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we continue to pray together in the words he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please do share the peace with one another. And that we can always trust in your unfailing mercy. Out of that mercy you have given us so much. May all that we offer you today and in the coming days of this week and always be a response of humble gratitude and a true reflection of your unstinting generosity. Make us channels of your grace and peace in a world of crying need through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in worship singing our next hymn, 718, We Cannot Measure How You Heal. This morning's first reading is from Proverbs chapter 12, reading from verse 14 through to 20. 
From the fruit of the mouth, one is filled with good things, and manual labour has its reward. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to advice. Fools show their anger at once, but the prudent ignore an insult. Whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness speaks deceitfully. Rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Deceit is in the mind of those who plan evil, but those who counsel peace have joy. Next reading is from James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Amen. So we stand to sing our next hymn number 755, Be Still and Know That I Am God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. These words of Matthew 5, 9, the seventh of the eight so-called Beatitudes in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount are our basic text this morning. Although not in either of our readings from Proverbs and James, they stand, I think, in the closest relationship to them both. The Beatitudes, Billy Graham sometimes called them the beautiful attitudes, um, are the introduction to Jesus' kingdom manifesto in which he, set, which he sets out in the Sermon on the Mount. 
they sum up Jesus' teaching about what it means to live as children of God's kingdom. And in them he declares the blessings of God's kingdom and gives a vision of a world redeemed by love and the qualities of Christian discipleship that will contribute to bringing that about. This month marks the 28th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. And as the moderator encouraged us to do, we, we join with many others in remembering that terrible atrocity and in seeking to learn important ongoing lessons from it. Most of you will be aware of what happened in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the month of July 1995 the context in the aftermath of the breakup of Yugoslavia was a plan hatched by ultra-nationalists fueled by hatred and division to create a greater Serbia <clears throat> of ethnically pure Serbs. And this required, they judged, the ethnic cleansing of Bosniak Muslims from Bosnia and Herzegovina. In the space of just a few days in Srebrenica, as part of that plan, over 8,000 men and boys were murdered in cold blood and buried in mass graves. One of the most poignant experiences of my own time as moderator, that, and that wasn't yesterday, was visiting Srebrenica uh, in February 2015, meeting grieving relatives, and survivors and standing in the Potokari Cemetery where the slaughtered now lie. And it was a privilege to welcome some of the relatives to the 20th anniversary service in July of that year in St. Giles Cathedral. There weren't too many dry eyes in church that day. The theme of remembering Srebrenica 2023 is together we are one. It's only too evident, however, that we are still looking out on a divided and conflict-ridden world. There is much truth in the observation of Hegel, the German philosopher. History teaches us that we learn nothing from history. The 20th century was the most bloody century in history. Since 1945, not a single week has passed without a war somewhere in the world. The world yearns for peace. <clears throat> Closer to home, so do many of our unhappy neighborhoods. There was even a program on TV some time back, was there not neighbors from hell? And what are we to make of the fact that an incident of domestic violence occurs every 20 seconds in the United Kingdom with untold suffering for so many innocent children? And although it's been shown that the war in Bosnia was not motivated by the tenets of Orthodox Christianity, nor supported by Orthodox church leaders, and so it was not a religious war per se, it's clear that the nationalist leaders were eager to define the ethnic groups in religious terms and perfectly happy to deploy religious rhetoric and symbolism to encourage support for this evil. And that, of course, inevitably made difficult the participation of religious leaders later in the subsequent task of reconciliation and reparation. Since we've just noted a certain religious element in the Srebrenica genocide, I think it's important also to say this, to recognize that some 80% of religious acts of discrimination in the world today are directed against Christians. Leading the distinguished American writer and author John Allen in a Spectator article to remark that the global war on Christians remains the greatest story untold in the 21st century. The media, of course, have far more important things on their mind, like the latest shenanigans on Love Island. I'm reminded often of the title of a 1963 comedy film, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Standing in the mess of a world of seemingly end, unending conflict, war, polarizations, anger, violence, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. 
he did not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. Do you think it makes a difference? Would it have made a difference if he had substituted peacekeepers for peacemakers? Well, you only have to recall Srebrenica to get the right answer to that question. Srebrenica and its environs were placed under United Nations protection in 1993. And in July 1995, Dutch UN troops, you know, with their distinctive blue helmets, looked on helplessly while Bosnian Serb soldiers engaged in their genocidal executions, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them over a weekend. Peacekeeping refers to the attempt to secure peace by force. The United Nations peacekeepers deploy tanks and troops and weaponry of all sorts. They try to keep otherwise warring groups apart. And there's a place doubtless for that. And there may be something indeed to be said for their effort. But where there is no will on either side, there is no peace at all. It's an exercise in what Jeremiah spoke of, <clears throat> a superficial treating of the wound, a saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. What Jesus, what our Proverbs and James passages also refer to is something radically different. Blessed are the peacemakers. Just take the two constituent parts of that word, which interestingly occurs only here in the New Testament, a hapax legomenon for the grammarians among you. In Jesus' kingdom manifesto, peace links into the great narrative arc of scripture, revealing at its heart God's agenda of peace for his world. It's an agenda centered on and ultimately achieved by God's own coming among us in Jesus, into the ugly messiness of a world broken and torn apart by human sin and folly. A key passage here is Paul's magnificent description or depiction in Colossians of Christ as the supreme peacemaker, Colossians 1.20. In that verse, he Paul uses the verbal equivalent of the noun that Jesus uses in Matthew, and he says this, For in him, that is Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. An extraordinary passage with an unmistakable universal thrust, which uh, gives a real headache to some who struggle to make it say something other than what Paul clearly says. Peace, Irene, shalom, these great words open before us the biblical vision of God's good creation, marked by wholeness, harmony, balance, coherence, in which all of nature and humanity relate in peace, within the abundance of God's own peace, together as one, in relations that reflect his justice, his unity, his love. And if that's the picture of Genesis 1 and 2, when we turn into Genesis 3, we have this picture of the tragic fracturing of these relationships, when all becomes sin and shame shameless hubris married to blatant disobedience, the ugly roots of the ongoing human predicament and tragedy. Because the tragedy of the human problem remains the problem of the human heart. But the heart of the Christian good news is this, to complete that verse of Newman's great hymn that I alluded to, O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. A second Adam. Peace on earth, the angels sang at his birth. He is our peace, said Paul. His victory on the cross was one of peace. See, as individuals, we long for peace. Peace with God fundamentally. 
peace within ourselves, peace with one another, peace in relating to the natural world, the environment in which we live. And Christ himself is our peace. And the great peacemaker is still looking, as it were, for volunteers, recruits for his peace corps, committed, people committed to spreading his peace all over the world, through themselves first believing in and following him as his disciple, the great prince of peace. It's what hearts everywhere are yearning for. Ernest Hemingway, the great writer in his short story, The Capital of the World, set in Spain, tells of a father and son. <clears throat> Paco, very common name in Spain, at least at that time, and with ambitions to become a matador and to escape his father's, you know, restrictive control, uh, Paco runs away to the capital, hence the title of the, the story, the capital, Madrid. And his father, desperate to be, to find and to be reconciled with his son, follows him to Madrid, and he puts an ad in a local newspaper <clears throat> with these words. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. Hemingway then writes, the next day at noon in front of the newspaper office, there were 800 Pacos. <laughs> All seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. The world is full of such people, desperate for reconciliation, for forgiveness. And we who have, through grace, found that joy in Christ, are now sent out as instruments of that peace, introducing others to the Prince of Peace and aiming at the healing at every level of fractured relationships. You see, peacekeepers build a 10 foot high wall so that I don't even have to look at my difficult neighbor or she at me. Peacemakers aim to dismantle that wall so that my neighbor and I can not only see each other but come to enjoy one another in a relationship of reconciled love. And it's a goal that requires to be driven by a love that constrains us to roll up our sleeves and get involved in the mess and brokenness of the world, and that risks the outcome of rejection and eventual crucifixion. But love, love at last, is the only force on earth capable of turning an enemy into a friend. At the deepest level, it's what God does for us in Christ. And as Leon Morris remarks, there is something godlike about bringing peace to people and people to peace. As followers of Jesus, we can do no other. When relationships are failing, we must be the ones to reach out and build bridges. We must try to discover the chemistry of conflicts and see what might be, we might be able to do to help bring hope into that situation. We must be willing to go out of our comfort zones in the pursuit of peace and reconciliation. And that is difficult. That is extremely difficult. Paul wrote to the Romans, the Christians in Rome, chapter 12 of his letter, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. If it is possible, it may turn out not to be in particular case, but that is still the goal. And challenging as it is, as our Proverbs reading reminds us, this is the way to joy. And as James told us, 
It's also the path of true wisdom, the wisdom that recognizes the truth of remembering Srebrenica's 2023 theme, together we are one. We're not so naive as to imagine our peacemaking endeavors will always bear immediate fruit. Stanley Hauerwas, the Christian ethicist, writes about the integral link between the securing of peace and the passage of time. Time can be a huge factor here. It can be long haul work and we may not even see its results in our own time. But we do sometimes see the efforts in this direction crowned with success by God's blessing. And that is something very, very special to see. You may have heard of the um, tradition of Japanese pottery known as kintsugi, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Kintsugi, meaning golden joinery. Uh, the underlying philosophy is that breakages and repair are to be treated as part of the history of an object rather than something to, you know, disguise. So a broken ceramic vessel is put back together, but not in the original form. Instead, the restoration process involves the use of maybe pure gold or silver to mend the divide and heal the fissure and it's evident at the end of the process that something broken is transformed into a work of art and it's even more valuable and more beautiful than it was before. And this happens in human life when through God's grace past hurts, resentments and grudges are let go and we choose to move forward with love and understanding. Something new and beautiful has been created and we're talking here about a family trait it's what god longs to see among his sons and daughters it's what marks out citizens of his kingdom blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of god you may recall as a parent when maybe at one point you saw your child uh, do, do something or react in a particular way or heard your child say something and in a flash you realize that that's just reflected something deep in you, the parent, and you find yourself saying, that's my boy, that's my girl. And I believe there's something that corresponds to that in God when he sees us through his own grace, doing what we can, depending on him, maybe in the face of heavy odds or in what we feel is a, a pretty insignificant context, to promote the cause of peace. Well, God is looking at you, his child, and he as he recognizes something of his own character in what you might think of as your stumbling peacemaking efforts wondering if they're of any value at all. And he looks at that with infinite parental pleasure. And he says, that's my girl. That's my boy. They shall be called children of God. Well, here's a closing challenge. What is the one thing you could do this week to live that imagined long for kingdom future of shalom that we pray and work towards when in the fullest sense together we are one in a world that is yet to be reflecting on that and in closing can i invite us all to join together making the words of the peace-loving peacemaking St. Francis, the expression of our own longing and prayer. The words are on the screen. Shall we, as able, pray together? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, defame. 
Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let's stand to sing our next hymn, number 710, I have a dream a man once said. prayers of the people, let us pray. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Loving God, we pray for all people whose lives are affected by conflict between and within nations. We remember especially the people of Ukraine and of Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Israel, Palestine, Myanmar, Sudan and South Sudan, Syria and Yemen. 
we pray for an end to all wars and the coming of just and lasting peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose communities continue to be scarred by past conflicts. And in the week following the anniversary of the 1995 Srebrenica massacre, remember especially the people of Bo Bosnia, Herzegovina, and other parts of the former Yugoslavia. May they find reconciliation and the means to live in harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. <clears throat> we pray for peacemakers and peacekeepers and ask you to bless their efforts to find a just resolution of conflicts and to prevent them from recurring. We remember especially the work of the United Nations and its agencies and peacekeeping forces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace in our own nation and in our own communities, for mutual understanding and toleration of differences and for all who work to build harmony in society and within families. May we seek to be peacemakers in our daily lives so that we can justly be called your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We end with a Gallic blessing. Deep peace of the running wave to you deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the gentle night to you, moon and stars pour their healing light on you, deep peace of Christ, the light of the world to you, deep peace of Christ to you. In his name we pray, amen. amen. to our closing hymn this morning, number 159. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided. Stand to sing. <laughs>
the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you all this day and evermore.